All right. Well, uh, happy. <laughs> what day is today? Wednesday? Is it Wednesday? Gosh, is it Wednesday already? Is it Wednesday? Gotta be, right? What does my phone say? Gosh, that's <clears throat> where is my, my hour? I gotta double check my phone. Yes. <laughs> happy, happy Wednesday. We're back at it with more of the trouble shooters. This is exactly where we left off yesterday and this was done deliberately because i think this challenges section and some of the other things going into combat some of the sub systems were good and i didn't want to get partly into it and then have to rush so let's just get back to it so challenges oh gosh my glasses are dirty challenges challenges are, challenges are used in situations that require cooperation take time or involve multiple skills between three and five skills challenges can use simple or opposed task checks a challenge will have an outcome depending on how many of the task checks succeed, or in the case of opposed challenges, who won. When written, challenges specify what skills are to be used and why. A list of modifiers, optionally, and a list of outcomes and what they mean. If there are more modifiers than skills, they generally can stack at the director's discretion. So it looks like a challenge is there what they're calling, I guess, what we called in fourth edition and has become popularized as a skill challenge. This would seem to be their version or just their restatement of a, the same type of mechanic. I'm not a super huge fan of skill challenges as things. I just don't love them. I, I understand the appeal. And I think probably in a game like this, because I was going to say, I think in a game that's kind of really narrative, and you're almost, you're doing sort of a montage kind of uh, cinematic effect or something of that sort where you're not trying to really remain, you're not really trying to remain zoomed in on a particular thing. For, for example, in a chase, you're not, you're not really trying to be zoomed in on the literal navigation of the streets or hallways or whatever it is that you're, that you're being chased on. But it's rather, it's now you've pulled the camera back and you're trying to show the scramble and the skill challenges represent these things that are happening that you're sort of seeing zoomed out. So you're really not worried about specifically, okay, this street goes left and then we got to go right, then we go left. It's more just that feel of, oh, do you remember the right way to go? Or, oh, can you use this market as, as they try to lose them in this kind of a, say, a, a flea market area? Oh, okay. Like that kind of thing, as opposed to being really in the moment. I think, I guess I just prefer to be in the moment, but at least in a game like this, it makes a lot more sense, I feel like, than in, say, D&D. &D. Though people love to use it in D&D. &D. I know that it was a big thing in 4th edition, and folks like Matt Colville have were uh, repopularized it for 5th edition. But, you know, me personally, not the biggest fan, but if I, I feel like for this sort of game, it probably works. Outcome. There are five possible outcomes of a challenge. A great outcome, the desired result of the challenge, but even better. There could be a bonus effect, improved quality that adds a good tag to a project, up modifiers to future roles etc a good outcome this is the desired result of the challenge a limited outcome the desired result of the challenge but with an additional bad effect a hard choice a flaw that adds a bad tag down modifiers to future roles, etc then a bad outcome and then finally an abysmal outcome so you'd have a nice scaling of, uh, or spectrum of potential results there running a challenge when running a challenge tell the players what skills are involved to have the players just distribute the task checks as evenly as possible among the characters in the scene Every character in the scene should have at least one task check. Then the players make the task checks, keep track of how many checks succeed and which ones, depending on how many checks there are in total for the challenge and how many of them succeed, you get an outcome. And then we have just a little bit of table that does that. So I, I think that the things that are nice here, which is the same way that they were run uh, classically, whatever, in the fourth edition or fifth edition census, everybody has to do something. You can't alpha character it and say, oh, my guy is good at all these things and therefore you don't have to do anything. It's kind of like, okay, you're going to have to go around. And obviously, people are going to try to find the tasks that they're most suited for. And then you're going to do sort of a round robin going around and seeing, you know, rolling dice and figuring out whose particular tasks succeeded, who's failed, and then what that means for the challenge at large. Alvalder says that they picked up this game on Kickstarter, but never had a chance to run it. Love the Franco-Belgian comic style. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a big fan. It, it's got a beautiful look to it. Very Tintin-esque. Very Tintin-esque. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I, I didn't realize this went through Kickstarter. Uh, it's, it makes sense. So much things go through Kickstarter these days. We have some bullet points on how to create challenges. I'm going to skip because it's not super 
important in for us, just as we're getting kind of an overview. Now we'll go into duels, which are a duel is a special kind of challenge. It is often used uh, for chases. Uh, here we go. Chases, games, and even actual duels. Any case where two sides challenge one another to some kind of competition that involves more than one skill or takes time. Each side of the duel may consist of one or more participants. In the duel, you try to be the first to win a number of opposed task checks. You don't set the skills for the task checks in advance, but make them up as you go. All right, so this is a, a I guess this is their idea of an opposed challenge. Usually when you're running a, a skill challenge in the fourth edition, fifth edition, whatever kind of d, &D sort of sense, is the player's just making rolls. Uh, one of the examples, I think the one that Matt Colville used way back uh, one of his videos when he went over it was, oh, you're trying to escape this dungeon castle that's collapsing. Okay, you're making rolls. The, the the dungeon collapsing isn't making any rolls against the party. It's just a matter of the party putting together enough positive rolls to say, hey, we won or we won with a cost or we're, we're buried alive, whatever it is. <clears throat> so the wrinkle here for this is that now we're looking at, okay, it's that skill challenge concept, but we have this opposing force and let's see how they work these together. At the start of the duel, the director sets up a target number, usually three. Whoever wins that many task checks first wins the challenge. Both parties decide on what they want from the challenge or what they hope the outcome of, of the duel will be. The participant who initiates the duel goes first and calls an opposed task check for any skill that suits the purpose of the duel, narrate the action, and provide reasoning for the skill choice. Then both parties make an opposed task check for that skill. Note who won that task check. The winner narrates the outcome of that task check. If, and nobody won because both failed or because both succeeded, but the roles are tied. Then the score stands and the participant who called for the task check narrates the outcome. Then the other party does the same, call an opposed task check, provide reasoning for it and make the task check. This is a lot of task check saying. Repeat until one side has won as many task checks as the number as the target number and wins the duel. The winner now narrates how they reach the desired outcome. All right, so it seems like you're going back and forth. It seems like this could be kind of fun <clears throat> in the sense that, okay, you're in this situation in, in which there's a little bit of jockeying uh, for position. Maybe you are, for example, let's say you're in a, uh, and we'll go through the example because I feel like it's, I think that's an example on the side and it probably is useful, but I imagine something like you're in a gunfight at the, uh, you know, a, a one, two guys in the middle of the street and uh, ye old one horse town, tumbleweed rolls by and you have your fingers on your triggers. And this is a classic, literally a duel. So the new is cowboy in the white hat decide to, you know, uh, use, uh, I don't know, use a little bit of uh, some kind of skill, let's say acrobatics to sort of do a little side shimmy step, right? To throw the other person off course, maybe maybe zig and then zag a little, a little subtle, you know, subtle body language, but in terms of the gunfight that could help give you a little bit, give you a little bit of this in your favor, right? So you do a little, you want to do a little dip dive. Maybe think you're kind of going to pivot one direction a little bit. Then maybe as they start to aim that way, you, you know, you, you're able to kind of pivot the other way and catch them off guard. Okay, fine. So you, you decide, I don't know, acrobatics, okay, whatever, that whatever that skill may, might be. And then, so then you would both make this opposed skill check. Now, maybe instead you would say, okay, I want to use, let's say I have a quick draw skill. I want to use a quick draw skill just to try to just get my gun out, get out first. First person who fires is probably going to win if the aim is, both aim is good, so... I'm going to quick draw out first. But then you might think to yourself, whoa, 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 whoa. Black Hat Cowboy over there, I know that they're super fast draws. So if I try them on that tack, I'm probably going to lose. Hence, I'm trying my little dippity do. So that, that's kind of neat. I like that because it's not just me game planning what I might be strongest in. It's maybe me game planning what I think the opposing force might be weaker in or where I have the biggest advantage, which might not be the same. Maybe I've got a really good skill level in, in one skill, but I know that they also have a really good one in that skill. So it's strength on strength. Maybe I have some other skill or I think if I can work this in, I'm not as good at it, but I know that they're terrible at it. So I want to try that one instead. So I, I kind of like a little bit of that of trying to figure out what's working. Let's see what the, uh, let's see what the example says. So here we have the director says catching up with the secret agent is a duel. Let's go for a target number of three. Since you have initiated the chase, you go first. 
His goal is to get away from you. What's your goal? And then the player says, my goal is to catch up with him and stop him. I think I'll keep my vehicles to be my ace in the hole. So I'll start with alertness to see which way he goes. A success at 49. Right. The agent fails with a roll of 81. Right. He zooms off in the night and I burn rubber to get after him. As I have my headlights down, he doesn't notice me at first, but I can clearly see the rear red rear lights of his car. Your turn. The agent assumes that he will be pursued, so he will still try to trick any pursuers by taking an alternate route and hiding in front of a lorry with a uh, sneak. And I should roll for sneak as well. That's weird. Doesn't search work better? Go for that. Doesn't my, and then another player chimes in, doesn't my elect electrical tracking device sabotage count? And then the director says, well, it counts. Electra, you get plus two pips on your task check. The agent is a sneaky bastard with 65%, and I roll 67, which is a fail. And then Electra says, I have 45 and fail with a roll of 59. I can't even flip that, and the plus two pip didn't help. The example continues. So we're at, an all, uh, we're at one nothing in wins. You saw him get off on that alternate route, and you can still see the rear lights now and then in front of the truck. Your turn. Okay, I think it's time for some serious driving. As we approach Graz, I step on the accelerator and overtake the lorry and catch up with him. So that's vehicle or vehicles, and I think I should have plus two pips from the Lancia. Hal, 82, beat that, or ha, 82, beat that. He tries to keep you at bay with a roll of 69, but that's less than your 82, so it's a second win for you. Right, suddenly I zoom by the lorry, headlights glaring in the night, and come up side by side with him, right in front of a surprised lorry driver, honking his horn like a madman. Right, he reacts violently, as and as you pass the city limit of grass, he pulls his gun and shoots at you. It's a hit of 36. You may oppose his ranged combat with agility if you want. Ow, I have 15 in agility. I can't even beat that. And then the other player says, I'm still here. Can I yank his arm with melee instead? Uh, okay, I will accept that. And then the player goes, right. Oh, 44, that's a win and good karma as well. As he pulls his gun and aims across the passenger seat, I grab his arm and pull it down so that he only shoots the inside of the car. I bite him in the arm for good measure. And then the first player says, ha-ha, three wins. As Eloise yanks his arm and bites him, he loses control of his car and slams right into a bus stop. Poor car. Okay. Hey, Gashman. All right. So we see here this example, right? It's And it's meant to be kind of fluid. There's a couple of players, and it looks like the situation was that one player was in the car with a bad guy, maybe taken kidnapped, taken hostage, or, or maybe even undercover. We don't know the context for all of that. But they're able to throw in and say, hey, can I use this skill for this? Can I use this skill for that? Great. And you can see how they are since this is kind of that kind of narrative sort of game is they're able to really take control for a moment and, and setting the scene. So they're able to kind of say what happens next, even though they're not necessarily in control of that car. They're able to talk about, you know, how it how it stops, how it ends, all that all that good, good, good narrative sharing, narrative sharing. I'm not sure what it's called. Narrative sharing stuff. Brian Smith says, seems too granular, granular, though maybe that's the tone. Well, it's granular. I mean, the numbers, I mean, yeah, there's some, I guess there is some, uh, the, the mathiness as opposed to something really basic, but you're just rolling a D100 versus your skill. Uh, which part do you find really granular, Brian Smith? The rolls or the fact that it's not, wasn't just one roll for the entire thing? I mean, I do like that for this, say, chasing, you could see that there's, Maybe this, I'm sure in the example, it's probably intentional. I don't know if this would happen every time, but how the stakes are kind of raised up. Oh, okay, he's doing this, you're doing this, and then the, the countering. And it feels like, anyway, you're building building things up to which the moves are getting bigger. Maybe that wouldn't always be that way, right? But okay, you're you're trailing. They take the alternate path, but they get ahead of the truck. And so then you're now you have to zoom and you get in front of the truck. So I, I kind of like that how like a chase sequence might be in a film or TV show. It's sort of, you know, you can feel the sort of stakes and everything raising, raising up. Um, Brian Smith says the narrative. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like it's too, I don't feel like it's too narrative. I, I, I don't, I would say for myself, I don't feel like it's too granular, but of course it's going to be your miles. Your miles may vary kind of thing. Um, I, I think it's, if you imagine, we could think about well, what would the alternative be for this kind of sequence, right? What would they, you know, so here's, right, here's, like, I guess maybe here's the better or the best, I don't know if it's the best. Here's maybe a, a, a different way of looking at it. Well, what, what would be the alternative way to adjudicate this kind of chase? Would it just be speed? 
okay, his car has a top speed mile an hour of this much. Her car has a top speed of this much. Maybe make one check, handle vehicles driving check, and that would settle. They they win, you catch up, they lose, they go away. Like, yeah, it could be something like that, a single, just a single roll. Oh, and they got away. Oh, they're 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 there. Or would you go into, or the other, another alternative might be you're doing combat style, round by round, round one. He drives, he can go up to however many miles per hour uh, safely, so he does that. Okay, I've got to catch up, so I'm maybe going to do unsafely, and I catch up so much, and we could be literally on a board with squares, rolling down, and then just kind of doing it turn by turn. That would be another way to do it. I, I think the advantage of this kind of approach over, say, the turn by turn approach is that there's there's not going to be very many if any uh, sort of downtime right where it's just because one of the things in the chase sequence thing that's frustrating and if you're running it sort of just combat style can be that everyone's just sort of staying put everyone's like it's you know i run 60 i run 60 i run 60 i run 60 kind of like that and you and nothing seems to be happening necessarily i feel like doing it this way you, you, you kind of wipe away some of that because every time you have every round of this challenge this duel you're, you're sort of progressing things so at least things seem to be changing hey zach this one caught their eye i dig it, I dig it already just from the spread yeah no the the styling it, it's very well done very well illustrated very well composed in terms of the layout they met, they found the kind of Tintin or Tintin esque sort of font for the headers. Yeah, it's it's, it's and it's got some nice got some nice systems. The, Zach, this is this this is a part two of this. So if you want to check out some more uh, of the beginnings part of the book and and more of the uh, kind of the basics of the system, if you check out yesterday's stream, it shall be there for you. How to resolve situations using task checks, opposed checks, and challenges. You can resolve most situations. Here are some examples. How to use these mechanics. And then we have a huge list. Oh, uh, let's see. So art research, for example, might use contacts, investigation, humanities, and then the search challenge. Crypt analysis might include investigation, languages, science, and a security challenge. Uh, what we'll see. What's another one? Wounded condition. No, oh, has no effect for one scene. A medicine check. Oh, I see. So maybe to sort of neutralize for seeing someone's wounded condition, medicine test checked by somebody else. You need to understand some blueprints, electronics, engineering, investigation, and a science challenge. So there you go. I, kinda, I, I do like that they give you a list. Obviously, you don't have to use these, and you can uh, figure out what you want, but it's nice that just in a pinch, you might look to see which one of these is closest to what you're doing, and you've kind of got a, a jump start on figuring out how you want to run it. Fights and combat. The context of fights. In the troubleshooters, there will be danger and challenges, fisticuffs and shootouts, even massive explosions. Despite that, the troublemakers isn't deadly or gritty. In this game, your character may be knocked unconscious or disappear from the scene or be taken prisoner, a staple of the genre, but your character will not die unless <clears throat> that's what you want or you do something really stupid. <laughs> oh, the caveat of, hey, it's mostly going to be up to you, except if you do something very dumb. But we still want fights to be fair. After all, you are to capture, or even if you are to capture or even kill the characters, you better do it by the book, even if you are the director. Just fighting is boring. When you plan a fight, give it context and meaning. Make sure there's a reason for the con conflict that gets the players invested in the scene. So I think that's always good advice. Give context and meaning. Don't just have folks there to fight just to fight. Have them there to, to do something. Give them a goal. Give them, you know, have it be meaningful. And that was a sip of watered down apple cider for the working man. Consequence of fights. Although fights in the troubleshooters do not lead to de the death of characters, unless the player wants that to happen, there are still consequences. In the short term, fights attract attention. Gunshots will result in armed police showing up at the location very fast. Even fist fights in public may make people call the police. In the long term, wounds need care. Professionals will also call the police if characters walk into the yard ER with bullet wounds. And even, even if you can get a shady doctor to treat your wounds, recuperation is slow. So there you go. So if you're wondering, well, <clears throat> if, if combats aren't particularly deadly, then what are the consequences of losing? Here we go. What's happening in the short term? It may short circuit what you're trying to do. 
because we're not in, you know, sort of a fantasy wilderness where nobody's around. So there's going to be cops, there's going to be people. And if the cops intervene, presumably that's usually going to mean that you're going to either get arrested, detained, sent home, your forward progress is going to be stopped and, and potentially the location or wherever this is taking place, if that's important, may be made more difficult or even impossible if you get into. So you have those kinds of mission or narrative critical uh uh, fall or not fallbacks, uh, drawbacks, obstacles. And then the long term, you may again have to deal with the police, you have to deal with the doctors, hospitalization, slow healing, and, and missing out on time that maybe your team vitally needs to get things done. So you don't want to, even though you're not necessarily going to die, you don't necessarily want to get into combats you don't need to get into. And then you're going to want to, you know, be as efficient as possible. When the fight starts, set up the scene's zones and then determine initiative order. What are zones? This is the basic unit of space in a fight is the zone. A zone is an area that is distinct and somewhat homogenous. It doesn't matter exactly where in the zone you are. It is assumed that you are constantly moving about. And that's when you do something or when something happens to you. You happen to be in the appropriate location in the zone. Moving between zones is an action, however. Often it just requires you to use the move action, but sometimes the move action requires a task check. Zones are not intended to be used to measure distances, but to make, ter the ter to, to make terrain interesting and to make tactical movement easy without a grid. So they're doing some kind of zone system. We've seen these before, or I don't know, I have, maybe you have, things like you're in near, which would put you kind of in melee range versus far, which would mean that you're close enough for missile fire and then something maybe distant which is beyond missile fire and then you usually can move from zone to zone of course you know you're always if somebody i guess move from relative zone to zone so if somebody is far to you and they're shooting you with arrows you could use one of your moves and move into that it move move <laughs> move into that range band which would then make them near to you which means you could then you know attack them stuff like that it, it's essentially a way of managing relative distances of combatants without grids and without other things. It works pretty well. I think I feel like my explanation is probably a lot clunkier than it needed to be. You know, essentially you just have zones which kind of indicate roughly abstractly how far things are away from you. And generally you can move one tick closer to a thing or further away from a thing. So if you're already far distant from a thing, you could do one move, which move would then put you distant to the thing or close to near, etc. Different systems use different amounts of zones. We'll see in a minute how many zones or how they do their zones, but that's kind of the long and short of it. Zach Wolf says, I don't think they mean distances like uh, near, far, distant. Well, we'll we'll see in a, in, a, in a minute what they mean. And then Zach says, you create conceptual areas in the battlefield. Ah, well, let's give it a read. Did I skip? Okay, so that was zones. If an area, so it looks like maybe their zones, like Zach is saying, is, what did I get? Is not, right, because they just said it's not for measuring distances. It's more for, whoops, I keep going the wrong way. More for um, terrain and stuff. So let's see. Let's see what they mean. If an area is so huge that it would be silly to not have some distance involved, plan the zones accordingly. Set up objects that restrict movement into certain zones and give zones different properties. Here's a note here. If I plan a showdown in an open square, I better not make it just to slit the sidewalk into two zones. I also add Agent X's spy car and Electra's car to the street, and I make the area between them into a zone, which splits the street zone into three. It's a bit difficult to get in and out of that zone because of the blocking cars. Technically, inside the cars are also zones, both of which are difficult to get into and out of. So you can see, as Zach pointed out, they're splitting it into conceptual areas. There's still, I, I do think that there's probably some idea of distance in here, but they don't, I think the bottom line is you don't really care about it. It's more about each one of these, you're trying to make these interesting areas. And I think this is a pretty neat system. I mean, I obviously have no idea how it works in play and hopefully they'll have maybe an example of doing all the, you know, all these kind of movements and how that relates. But clearly what you're trying to do is take an area Add and and then take an, uh, some kind of contiguous area, a sub area within, and you mark it off as a zone. And because if we're looking up at the original, and apologies if you're listening to this later and you can't see the pictures, but it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to conceptualize the pictures. But we just see that this square is just one big block, just one big open zone. Now they've added, at, props have been added to it. So the lines of trees, uh, 
the fountain, some benches. And what these things are doing is they're not just there because you tend to have benches and trees and fountains and squares. Obviously, you do. But what it's also doing is they're positioned in a way to help demarcate zones. So you can look at it and say, okay, from the steps up to the door out of this, whatever the building that's at the one end of the square to the fountain, that's one zone. So we can place things there. We can think about it. And if someone's asking kind of where they are in the space, that's where they are. Now, if somebody wanted to move to the, the closer part of the street of the uh, of the uh, square, it's not just, oh, I just move over there. You can think about, well, if you're under duress, let's say maybe you have to make some kind of agility check to move through the fountain or hop over the benches. Talking about the street area, okay, putting the two cars there and the bus stop means you have another area. As they said at the end of that example, okay, well, I want to get in between the cars. Maybe I want to use them for cover. Maybe the bad guy is over there and I need to get them or there's somebody's wounded and they've slumped down behind the car and I need to get over there to administer first aid. Same kind of thing. Okay. Well, because those cars form a barrier now, it's not just a matter of just moving from that particular invisible area to another. It's okay. How do you get to over there? You can try to hop the, whatever the bus stop looks like. You can try to get around that way. You can try to slide star ski and hunch like over the roof of the car, or you can do something else, right? What do you do? So I think so interesting how they're positioning these. Hopefully we'll get a sense of how they work, but I, I like the idea and I like how it forces from a, a I guess a scene design or, or area design. It's, hey, think about what kind of interesting little sub areas make. I kind of really feel like something like this should be made and plastered up and put on the wall for all the folks making battle maps. It's to look at this and say, hey, how can you take this big area you want to make and put have these little interesting sub areas in it? Because I, I feel like that's a problem with a lot of battle maps. And I'm automatically looking at this bottom one, the way it's laid out. And I'm like, yeah, that makes for a much more interesting scene, scenario, location for battle than the top one, which is just a square. Or even if they just had the fountain in the square kind of thing. But let's see. We get some examples down the way. So the, the director sort of sidebar kind of text says again, this way the seemingly boring empty square becomes a more interesting place to stage a fight. It's really simple. If the terrain is boring, add more zones and don't be afraid to put things into those zones to make them more interesting. This is the scene where the fight starts. Electra is in the Lancia and Agent X and Eloise are in the Aston Martin. Austrian border, border police may be on the way, but that's unknown for now. Roll for initiative. Okay, so that's, Kind of set the scene. The initiative role is a task check for alertness or the basic skill for the director characters that don't have alertness. On bad karma, your initiative is zero. If the check fails, your initiative is the ones of the role. If the check succeeds, your initiative is the tens plus the ones of the role. If you have good karma, you add 10. All right, so then they're using alertness instead of just a flat roll, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's... I, those kinds of things are nice. I think I, I I always liked that. I always thought that was a really good skill or feat alertness because it usually comes into play a lot. So you get a lot of mileage out of it. So on your turn, you've got move. You've got a free action. You have a main action. Move is moving. Uh, let's see if they say anything. Okay, so when you're moving, you may move to an available adjacent zone. Some zones may be restricted and require a task check to move into or out of them. So I think something like if you had a raised platform, let's say, and you, in order way to get up is to kind of jump and grab the, the edge of the platform, and lift yourself up, that would be a task check. I'm sure there are many other ideas we could think of, but that, you know, something like that. And then you have free actions. That's kind of saying something, picking or picking up something, dropping something, readying something, changing a weapon, breaking cover, falling prone. Those are all free. The main actions are things like sprinting, attacking, catching your breath, reloading, taking cover, surveying. And then, oh, if you survey, you get to re-roll your initiative. That's a nice little thing. So survey is a main action that says you survey the situation to get an overview of what is happening. Reroll your initiative. So that's a great way of, and, and it's, I, I guess it's that. Because I think in, depending on which systems, I don't know if it was 3.x, d d or whatnot, had this kind of, you could sort of roll your action over and pick your initiative. Like, I'm going to wait. This is kind of similar, but I like the feel of it more. Because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel fictional like you're just kind of waiting around. It feels like you're actually doing something. Like I can see having an action that's just, oh yeah, I'm going to use my, my use my binoculars, or I'm going to look through the scope of my rifle to kind of get a sense, and then I get to reroll my initiative as opposed to I'm just going to wait. 
kind of thing. But I, 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 it's nice that you have an, you have to, I mean, you have to eat an action to do it, but you can get high or theoretically try to get anyway, higher, higher up the, uh, the, the, the chain of actions than before. Bonus actions, you can take one bonus action directly after your main action if there is a condition or ability that allows for one. Okay, that's fine. And then end of turn, attacks and defense. The basic attack, an attack action consists of one shot or one swing. You hit the target several times trying to get through its defenses or fire a salvo or burst of shots in rapid succession. The exception is when a ranged weapon only allows for one shot. For instance, if it is a musket, a crossbow, or javelin, which really are exceptions in the modern era, or carefully aimed ranged shots. These multiple swings and shots are abstracted into the basic attack. I really wish that something like D&D had put that in writing so that we would avoid all the confusion of what it means when you kind of make an attack. It gets super complicated, so I'm glad that they put the kind of thing here that, yes, there are going to be exceptions to that abstraction when they make sense, like crossbows, javelins, things like that. No, you're not throwing eight javelins. You're not launching eight arrows or doing something like that, but for your just your main thwacking of things. Yes, we understand that one attack isn't just one swing of your sword. It's kind of the the sum total of all those swings, how many, you know, what gets through and how effective it is. So you, I'm not going to go through the whole things. I think, you know, you select the target, you make your rolls, and then you, you, you have, uh, depending on the type of weapon, you might have to reload it. It might be a single shot. It might be thrown. Uh, valid targets. Let's see. If it, if it's in melee, you can only attack targets in the same zone unless you or the tar- in, or the target zone specifies something else. That's for melee. In ranged combat, you can attack targets in your own zone or any zone that does not have a blocked line of sight and is in range. So there's is some some connection between zones and distance because, or maybe it's not the zones itself, but just distance itself. Because we do have the concept of range, but we haven't really seen what it is. It's not really important. Though. Line of sight. You don't need a grid to determine line of sight. Just look at the zone layout and decide whether the line of sight is clear, hindered, or blocked. Clear, you can see the target's entire zone from the attacker zone. Hindered, you can see parts of the zone, target zone from the attacker zone. Maybe there's a doorway, something like that. And that you get minus two pips for that. And then blocked, you can't see the target zone from the attacker's zone in any way. Might be around a corner on another level. The doors are closed. Doorways don't line up, etc. If the line of sight is blocked, the target is not valid. And then on talking about range, a few ranged weapons, mainly throwing weapons, have short range tag. This means the weapon can only be fired at a target that is X zones or less away from the attacker. The zone currently occupied by the attacker is not counted. So they are using zones for distance in a way, though, that's not the... Um, I suppose it's not the focus of zones. You might end up with some funny business. It probably doesn't matter too much, but if you had something that was complicated with a bunch of zones that might end up having something that's four zones away that you might not think is all that far. But I think overall, since the, you know everyone's kind of playing, it seems like how run and, run and gun sort of playing it loose, it's probably not going to matter super much. When you attack, you have some options available to you. If you don't pick one, you use the basic attack. So you can just try to melee throw or grapple someone. You can try an aim shot, but you have to have some initiative. You do. You can empty your weapon. Nice. You're just, just blasting. And then you have defense. Did you hit? You hit the target if, and then you have some bullet points, and then you can get some karma in combat. And I'm sort of skipping some of the these the, the most granular parts of the details because I'm not sure it's... I think we've got a good sense of what the overview is, and I don't feel like I need to go through every single part of it but it's here in the book obviously damage vitality and wounds Ooh, mortal peril let's see if the attacker hits the attacker rolls damage damage rolls explode for each six you get roll another die if any of those is a six roll another die and so on until you no longer roll any sixes for each four to six you end up with the defender uses one point of vitality if the defender is some kind of body armor or other forms of light protection The defender may make a soak roll for each four to to six in the soak roll, reduce the loss by one. And a pro tip says push any four to six dice to the side. That way you don't have to worry that they may tumble over while rolling more dice. That's a good idea. If vitality loss is zero or less, nothing happens. If the vitality loss is at least one, reduce the target's current vitality by that much. If the vitality ever reaches zero, you're out cold. 
player characters and some director characters can take the wounded or mortal peril conditions instead of vitality loss. All right, so what do these things mean? Out cold means that you're no longer in the fight. You're usually unconscious, but you might have been thrown off a cliff into the sea or out into a window or out a window, fallen down a trap door or something similar that removes you from the fight and stops you from returning. So basically you're, you're out of this moment. Player, player characters can take wounded and mortal peril. Unimportant director characters cannot. Mooks and underlings are out cold when vitality runs out. Lieutenant director characters can take the wounded condition. Boss director characters can take the mortal peril condition. They don't have to. Just like characters, they may be taken prisoner and wait for an opportune moment to try and escape. Even if jailed, they are often sprung between adventures to appear in the next. I do like these terms, right? You could be out cold, wounded, and in, in mortal peril, but we'll see what they actually mean. Player characters and bosses and lieutenant director characters can take the wounded condition instead of vitality loss. They don't have to, but they can choose to if they want to avoid getting out cold. Being wounded has consequences later, though, and it sticks for some time. So if you're wounded, after the fight, you remain wounded, and when the fight scene is over, all your task checks are at minus two until the wound heals. And we'll see healing later. You can only have one wounded at a time. If you are already wounded, you cannot take wounded again. Note that even if someone shoots you with a gun and inflicts loss of vital uh, lots of vitality loss, there's no harm, wounds, or blood unless you take the wounded condition. This is important. All right, so you so you can't if someone empties a clip into you, you choose for whatever reason choose not to be wounded, you're not wounded. So there's it's is that this is you have to take this, you have to take this particular status for it to go into effect you can't and i i'm guessing this is you can't be forced on you you know dm doesn't just go oh you're wounded it's like no you choose to be wounded instead of taking the vitality loss mortal peril player characters and boss characters can take the mortal peril condition instead of vitality loss again this is not mandatory but they can choose to if they want to to avoid getting out cold and want to risk everything so basically, being out cold doesn't seem to be very good if you'd rather do these instead. If you take the mortal peril condition, you can flip attack checks at will for the remainder of the scene, but it comes at a cost. If you are in mortal peril and you run out of vitality, you're not out cold, you're dead. All right, so that was the, hey, there's something you can do to be dead. That's it. You take the mortal peril condition, and that flipping dice means that when you're rolling, because the the your skill checks are all D100. So you're rolling... And flipping the dice means you can swap the ones and tens values. So if you rolled 14, you could swap that to 41. You roll 99, obviously you can't swap. So when you're in the mortal peril condition, you're going to get essentially a pretty good advantage. It's not going to work for everything, right? If you roll 44, if you roll 56 maybe or, or 78, probably not going to work very well for you. It's just not going to be very meaningful. However, you could do it. But if you run out of vitality, now I'm cold, you're dead. So the nice thing in here is I imagine that this that players are probably more likely to take this at the climax of the adventure when you just really need it. You want to go for it. You're like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go into mortal peril, and then it kind of means something. You probably don't want to be doing this every time you end up in a firefight, though it's there for you. And I like the fact that higher-level enemies, important enemies, can do it also. So what did we, did we even – did we get the out cold? Oh, it just means you're no longer in the fight. Oh, I see. That's when you've been okay, right? So out cold is you're out. So essentially, I, I I think I think I understand. So the reason why you'd want to take wounded and mortal peril is because you don't want to be out of the fight. If you take out cold, you're out, and uh, nothing nothing bad's going to happen to you ultimately long term. Or I'll, you're not going to die, you, but you're out of the scene. But you're out. If you want, if this is really two levels of pushing your luck. You can just take your loss and say, you know what, I'm going to slump here unconscious and you'll wake me up when it's all over. Great. Or I'll take the wound. But I can only have one, so if I'm already wounded, I can't do that. Or I'll take mortal peril and then really take it up a notch. That's neat. I, I, I could see uh, using that with some other things. I, I, I like, I, I, always, I always love push your luck, push your luck sort of stuff. And that is no exception. In the troubles, troubleshooters, by default, cast characters don't die. More often, you're out cold instead. Even director characters die rarely, if at all. There are three exceptions. Abuse, rules, or goodwill. When you're abusing the rules or the director's goodwill and do silly things, you may actually die. Basically, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. The example here is, since I can't die, I wrestle with the bear. Well, guess what happens? 
You might also choose to sacrifice yourself, or you might end up, you might choose to go into mortal peril. All those can lead to death. Killing. The troubleshooters is not a game where you kill indiscriminately or even in cold blood. Even unimportant director characters are rarely killed. Instead, enemies are knocked out, thrown out of the scene, or disarmed and forced to surrender when they are out cold. Bosses can die, but mostly only when it's dramatically appropriate. They use the same rules as player characters, so they can die from taking the mortal peril condition. Yeah, basically, it's like a TV show or, or a, a, a movie or like your yield tin tin book. Not a lot of people are dying, but, you know, they're getting knocked out. Like, again, thrown out of the scene, right? You, the mooks are scattering and they don't come back kind of thing. This is not a cold-blooded murder simulation game. Here we're going to get a combat example, which I like, starting, I guess, with the two, two agents, two sets of agents, or no, the one agent and then the bad guy and the other agent, who I'm not sure was captive or just there, arriving at the scene of the square that's been split up into multiple, uh, what do they call it, multiple zones. So the uh, director says, as I said, the order of initiative is Electra first, then Agent X, and finally Eloise. Electra starts in her car, Eloise and Agent X in his car. Electra, you go first. Electra says, I get out of the car and into the middle zone. Can I get directly into it? And the director says, it will take as long to get over the, to the passenger side as getting out on the left side and running around. You need to make a very difficult agility check to get out there as a move action or an easy agility check to get out the left side and into the middle as a move and a main action. If you fail the very difficult check, you're stuck in the car for this round, and if you make the easy check, you're out of the car, but not in the middle. Okay, so let's just break this down a little bit. So they're both in their cars, and to get out of the car, if she wants to, if she wants to uh, so she, the driver's side, is the, she wants to get into that zone between the two cars. She's on the driver's side, which is, which means she has to cross over, kind of crawl, leap thrust herself across the passenger side out the passenger door to get in the middle directly and the director the referee has, de has decided that is a very difficult agility check, agility check but the other option is to uh get out on the driver's side and then move around to the uh move, move around to the inside of that zone but that will take not only that move but also their main action whereas if they're able to shimmy out of the passenger side that would just be a move action so the player responds by saying very difficult you must be kidding me okay i get out and around the car haha -ha, i roll a 22 because it's an easy check i make it and to get good karma and a story point must be my lucky day so something good happens how about his gun has fallen to the floor somewhere and he so he can't shoot you oh i forgot that as a free action i pick up the wrench to have something to hit the agent with all right so there you go so free action got got a wrench Okay, the agent's turn. He tries to open the door on the driver's side, but it's jammed. That's the free action. So he makes that very difficult check to get over Eloise and out as his move action. When he's out, he realizes he has to get rid of Electra. I apologize, he says. I usually don't hit ladies. Then he attacks with his super secret martial art and hits with a 26. Gotta have, gotta have a super secret martial art, I must say. All right, so now for the for the agent's turn, the, the enemy driver is also on the far side, not trying to uh, not trying to get out, but he does. Let's see. So what does he decide to do? So he he tries to open the door on his side, but it's jammed. All right, and that was a free action, just opening the door, something easy. He makes a very difficult check to get over Eloise and out as his move action. So now he's moved out. Of, so he was able to do the check that the Electra character did not want to do. And interestingly, and I guess it's just the way the system is, right? It was very difficult for her to get through the empty car. It's not any harder for him to get through that car just because it's just shades are very difficult. So he just, it's very difficult, which I'm, I'm actually okay with. Uh, maybe if I was the Eloise player, I might I might want to whine and say, "Hey, why is it? Why was it very difficult for her, but not for him?" Kind of thing. But uh, you know, it is it is it is what it is. And then let's see. So he then tries to hit hit Elo El oh, sorry hit Electra with uh, once they he stepped in the middle and then he hits her. Uh, L, uh, the Electra player says, I defend myself with, uh, oh, I don't defend myself with a roll of 97. Right, so he hits you, you take one point of vitality loss. She says, ow. 
And then the Eloise player says, his gun is somewhere under the seat, right? I search for it. And then the director says, that's your main action then. So make a search check. 52, I find it. Great. You now have a 9mm Beretta and no license. That's the end of the round. At the start of the round, five, at round five, the border police will arrive. Now, next round, Electra. So what he's done there is set a nice little time limit, which I don't know if they mentioned in here, but we have a ticking clock, which is the border patrol is coming. So they don't have unlimited amounts of time to get things out because they're probably both going to have to scatter. You know, like in a spy spy game, they're both in a foreign land. Neither one of them could, has any protection here in terms of just getting arrested. So they got to they got to get what they're get whatever they're trying to do done and then skedaddle. Electra's player says, too bad for you that the Greek women aren't opposed to hitting horrible men. And then the wax him with a wrench. He fails the defense, so he's knocked prone. Serves him right. I inflict four points of vitality loss. He's down on the ground, gets up on all fours and says, I think I have to take the lady part back. You won't get away with this, bloody Greek hoppy. And you won't get away with kidnapping my friend, stupid British bulldog. I'm done. Oh, he's British. And I was giving him kind of a French accent. Well, it's his turn anyway, and he sweeps his with his feet, trying to trip you with an attack check of 59. Drat, 92. So he trips you, you are on the ground and prone, and he gets on top of you, twists your arms in an arm lock so that you are restrained too. And the other at, uh, other player goes, does he get up? No. And then she says, good. Then I, sh I shoot him, 21. I could flip that for two story points to 12. I do that. Right, and he defends himself. No, he doesn't. He's in another zone. So I hit and inflict uh, three points of vitality loss. That would make him out cold, but he's a boss and takes the wounded condition instead of the vitality loss. Eloise shoots him with his own pistol, making a hole and a red messy stain in his otherwise impeccable suit. And then it goes on and on. I don't think we need to read the rest of the example, but I think it's a good sense of how the how the game's working. So if you are, as soon as healing's over, two things can happen. If you have the mortal peril, you drop that condition now. This is assuming that this is when the fight's over. You restore your current vitality to max vitality. If you have the condition out cold, you eventually lose the condition. As soon as the fight scene is over, one other character that is not out cold can make a medicine chat task check. If it succeeds, you lose the condition and can act immediately. If the task check fails, you're still out cold until the scene following that. Basically, someone else has to make a successful medicine check or you have to skip a scene. If all characters are out cold or if some characters are out cold while others make a tactical retreat, they're at the director's mercy. They will still lose the condition eventually, but they may do so while tied to a chair or locked in a cell. All is not lost, however. They will gain nine story points each for being captured. Oh, that's cool. So you do get a nice little, little narrative meta currency for all getting captured. So basically... If you take the risk of taking the wounded condition, you will, uh, and you make it out of the scene, then you will be able to get back your vitality. You will still have that negative because you are still wounded, but you don't miss any scenes. If you're out cold, you're kind of at the mercy of the other folks around you to bring you back. And of course, mortal peril, either you survived or you didn't. Hey, Frederick, happy Easter. <laughs> Safety tip, big egg equals big bird, big bird equals tpk well if you're running yes if you're running easter themed games over the weekend or over this week uh, yes definitely players should be aware of the bigger the egg probably the bigger the bird it came from that was healing conditions so we have some other conditions we have blinded deaf exhausted frightened intoxicated in mortal peril on fire out cold overburdened so on and so forth i'm not going to go through all these but they have them all there so if you need to if either something's happening, and, and notice that, that they took some license, so for uh, which I didn't cover in the example, but she hit him with a wrench and he went prone. So right, said so I think, and, and I have a feeling that the game probably not going to say relies on, but probably expects you to visualize these scenes in sort of a cinematic way. In you know, with I mean, cinematic, yeah, cinematic way, but not with like, uh, I mean, I guess it depends on the type of cinema because there are definitely some movies where you. You know, it's not the ter they're not terminators, right? You know, you hit, hit Arnold with the wrench, and the wrench bends, and Arnold's glasses just get crooked, and he just kind of looks at you. The mean is that hey, it probably doesn't say under wrench when you hit somebody with a wrench, they go prone, but it just makes sense because that's kind of what happens, or at least the way we visualize you get hit with a wrench, you fall down, right? And then, of course, classically, what did the guy do? He fell down, then he did sort of swept, he did a little Johnny sweep the leg, 
knocked her down. These are things that you're sort of playing with in the moment based on the action doing that. There was nothing that said he had a certain attack skill that let him knock people prone or she didn't. It's just a matter of looking at the contacts and saying, yeah, it makes sense that hitting hitting this guy with the wrench is going to knock him off his feet. And by the same time, also makes sense if he does a sweep the legs, Johnny, her legs are swept. She's falling down as well. And then he also got the restrained thing, which was interesting. It was almost like two things at once. He kind of did the did the thing and then restrained her. Uh, and then we have some other things after that. <laughs> Frederick has this is speed racer hitting people people with wrenches. Could be. You bro, you know, this would probably make a really good speed racer engine, actually, Frederick. Uh, I could totally see using this for kind of a speed racer sort of game. And then who gets to play as Chim Chim? That's what I want to know. Other ways to get hurt. You could drown. You could, you could explode. You'd be in an explosion. It's fire falling. Oh, you got different, some different poison gas types. That's nice. You could be sniped or attacked from behind. It's tough. You could fall into a vat filled with sharks. Now we get to story points. All right, let's see how much, how big is story points? Okay, I think we can get through here before, before we, uh, the kid and the monkey did have all the fun. Absolutely. So story points. Story points are a kind of currency that cast characters can spend to influence the part, the plot. You can have up to 12, which is the limit. You start a session with four in your pool, unless the director says otherwise. You can use whatever you want to track them. That's fine. So, Every time you get a good karma or bad karma, you get one story point. If you get captured, you get nine story points. If you fail a task check to put yourself in a bind, you get two points. If you, if you activate a complication, it's going to vary. If you entertain the table, it's one point. Notice here that other than the good karma, which is something good happening to you and you're getting a little bit of an extra reward for it, or not really extra, it's, it's more like you rolled sixes or fours or whatever, that karma could be good or could be bad. If, if it ends up bad, if it ends up being good, you get get a post story point everything else is essentially bad things happening to you it's it's like they're giving you some extra juice of you get put into a bind or you put yourself in a bind you're going to get some right oh you're captured that kind of stinks narratively but here's nine points that you can then use for whatever kinds of things probably to help you get out of the bind. right the classic oh bond always gets captured but somehow he's got enough juice to figure out what's going on and release himself and run around and right and stop dr no's evil contraption from going off that's seems like that's kind of what it is. He sort of got powered up with story points, so he's able to wriggle free of the restraining devices before the laser cuts him in half. He's able to leap over the vat filled with crocodiles. He's able to punch out the guard, you know, guards, whatever it is, all that kind of stuff. You can say, okay, that's what they're doing. But I, what I like about it, I guess, is that it's one of those ways to encourage the players to take chances because even though the chances may put them in a bind narratively, they're going to get some extras out of it. So, hey, I'm going to take that chance and go out cold. Instead of constantly trying to get wounded to stay in the fight, I, you know, I'm going to take out cold. And if we all get knocked out, that's okay, because even if we get captured, we're going to have a bunch of points. And those points are going to help us try to figure stuff out. Or, hey, yeah, I got this activate, I got this complication. I'm going to activate it. I'm going to get something for it. The complication is going to put me in a, in, a, in a harder spot, but I'm getting something back for it. And if I even just try something that has – the consequence of getting us into trouble, we're going to get some of these story points. So I really, I really appreciate that because if we're looking at how can we encourage our party, our players to do things that are risky, this is a way of saying, hey, you're going to get a reward for doing something, even and maybe especially if it doesn't work out. Frederick says, could story points be cashed in for XP? I don't think so. I haven't seen anything about XP. I don't think they're using any kind of XP system it's skill. I know with the skills, you can kind of put check marks next to the skills. And we'll maybe we'll see something down the line of what it takes to upgrade a skill. But I don't think there's any levels. So there's no XP. But I suppose if you wanted to do this in a D&D &D type system, maybe you could have something like that. A meta, -currency, a meta currency that maybe you could, at the end of a session, you could convert to XP. Or not. All right. Well, have fun with the play test tonight, Frederick. Let me know how it goes. Using story points. Story points allow you to influence the story, open up new avenues of action, and fuel your abilities. So remember, you need story points to activate abilities. So that's one good usage. 
you can uh, potentially get gadgets. The five gear kits you start with may not be the ones you need for the adventure. To gain access to other gear kits, you may need to spend some story points. You can flip a check. Remember, if you roll the 91, you want to roll low. So you go, oh, I got 91. Oh, I can spend two points to flip it, which is also great if you're in kind of a rotten situation because maybe you maybe your slip out of restraints type skill is pretty low. But you can always just try it and then use those story points to flip. Get a clue. You can spend some points to get a clue. You can get some points get some points to add something minor to a scene. This is that sort of uh, you're able to kind of uh, uh, change up reality a little bit, right? Oh, is there uh, you know something like oh are there you know maybe uh, you look at the you're in a jail cell and you're restrained with I don't know one of those uh, those bands those restraining bands the ones that are kind of plastic and you know, you're looking around for some rough edges so you can try to rub it against it. And first, there's none. Maybe you send several story points and you can see somewhere where the bench has been worn in a spot that gives a sharp edge and then you can start rubbing it. Something like that, right? But here we have their examples of something minor. Could be there's a gun that someone dropped just over there. There's a big red button on the control panel. That's the fire alarm. You have a hairpin or lapel pin, which you can use to pick a lock. One of the villains is an old lover. Your chest attracts the attention of every villain in the opposite sex in the area. That's distracting them. That's inter interesting. Uh, yes, I, a, a gun, I feel like, I don't know if I'd have something that be minor, but maybe, I guess I guess the idea of the gun one, because the gun I'm thinking, that's pretty major. Maybe it's the idea that the gun was dropped as part of the scene, but now it's just near to you, right? If you had a whole bunch of things happening, a big scrum and... Uh, someone's gun got dropped and then kicked away and now you're in a bind you could sense the story story points it's like oh maybe the gun got kicked around and now it's laying near me kind of thing then you could add six points for something major and something major would be the old lover will help the characters escape uh, a, a kind of a big character shows up to save the character's bacon damage done in an earlier scene causes the wall to collapse so the characters can escape so something big so remember you got nine points for getting captured you could spend six of them still with a profit of three points to, to affect an, your escape majorly. If, if you, if you uh, can't figure out how to get out more efficiently. And there's a note about trying to do, add too much, which obviously you have to be aware of. And then you can also, uh, can you lose story points? I guess you can. The most common reason is to act against the genre conventions in particular killing and cold blood. All right. So, Basically, you shouldn't normally, you're not going to lose any story points, but it, you can be penalized if you start doing things which the game is saying, hey, we're not really here for this, which is like killing unnecessarily or in cold blood is basically the only one. And then we're on to equipment, equipment, which we will probably not go through. So I'm just going to go see through here. Is there anything else? We have some uh, after the adventure stuff. We do so you take the experience ticks. All right, so we'll do the post. I'm gonna do this really quick. The post session phase. After each game session, there's a post session phase in which you try to raise your skills or learn languages or abilities. The post phase, post session phase looks something like this. First, for each tick in the experience checkbox next to a skill, either make an experience check for that skill, a tick, uh, a tick for a language if the skill with the tick is languages, or a tick for an ability associated with the skill. Get free improvement ticks. For each improvement ticks, either make an experience check for that skill, a language, or okay, whatever. Okay, so all that stuff, great. Um, get reward checks after the adventure. Recalculate your vitality if necessary and determine the downtime. So the experience ticks. Each time you use a skill in a significant way, you get to tick the experience checkbox next to the skill value. You don't even have to make a successful task check for the skill or indeed even make a check at all as long as the skill is used in a significant way. And then, so you can only have one tick per skill. After the session, you can use each tick to do something, or do one of the following for that skill. So you can either make an experience check for that skill, you could put a tick towards learning a language, or you could put a tick towards gaining an ability. I see. Make an experience check. So you can either, so you can take the experience checks and turn them into languages. Am I reading that right? 
And then you also get a free improvement tick. And I think it can be more than one. So what is the experience checks? Here we go. Experience checks represent an attempt to improve a skill. When you use an experience tick or a free improvement tick this way, roll percentage and compare the result with the skill value. You cannot use story points to flip this check. If the result is equal to or greater than the skill value, the skill increases by a D6. Erase the old skill value and write the new value next to the skill. If the result is lower than the skill value, the skill is not increased. Either way, remove the tick in the checkbox. There you go. And then the example is, I have a tick in agility since last session. My current skill level is 63. I roll 73, so I roll a D6 to see how much it increases. The D6 ends up as 5, so I raise my agility from 63 to 68. I also have range combat 83% and a tick there. I roll 42, so range combat does not increase. It's hard to get better when you're the best. Exactly. So the highest possible skill value for our character is 106. And there's only one path to get there. You have to get exactly 100 in the skill. You have to roll 100 on the experience check and then roll 6 on the skill increase roll. <laughs> we never said that it was easy. All right. And then we have something about like languages and we can learn abilities. You can also reward with some checks. You can check if your vitality improves. And then downtime, we have some mending and uh, crafting stuff. You can shop, you can socialize, you can train, you can travel. And then we've got some, let's see, what are the director? I see. So basically just to pay attention to what the party's doing. And then we have a point-based experience as an alternate, if you want it. And then we get into the world of troubleshooters, which I'm going to skip over, but I'm guessing it's very 1010-esque, you know, but I think this is more kind of 60s, right? But we have a lot of stuff here with the, oh, like, I guess the air, like if you have an air travel map by car, by boat. And then we have some stats for some different, different locations. We got Berlin, including hotels and stuff. That's great. Hotel Adlon, the Savoy, the Schloss Hotel Gerhus. Very nice. Even languages. So in, in West Berlin, percentage chance is going to be mostly German. Get some English, get some French. In East Berlin, German, then Russian, English, and French. And what else we have? Buenos Aires, Cairo. Got to have Cairo. Hong Kong. And then Ice Station X-14, where the thing is currently hanging out. Oh, also Kyoto and Leningrad. Cool. And then if you just need a location... They give you a percentage die roll with <laughs> that that goes from the Titanic wreck of the Titanic to all kinds of locations all over the world, ending up with Tycho Crater on the moon. So you can definitely get your uh, get your sort of the, the width and breadth of your tin tin adventures across the world. And then we've got uh, some some uh, locations in France. And then we have Paris, including a nice map of at least Centreville ville in Paris, and then some public transport, and then libraries, place to eat and dine. Man, they really gave a lot. Oh, and now there's more. Hold on a minute. So now, I guess, let's see if this is... I'm going to... I think I'm going to... I'm just going to roll through this really quickly. <clears throat> I feel like we went through the, the kind of nuts and bolts of the most part. Of this, But this is good because this is basically a whole section on GM advice, or they call it the director advice. So about you know challenging players, presenting the setting, and moderating, and acting, and then we have a section here on creating adventures, which is awfully nice. Sometimes I, it, it's uh, it, it's hard because coming at it from an experienced, I don't know, someone who's been around these games a long time, how how <laughs> if that's made me experienced or a better GM, maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, or player, but oftentimes you know you're able to bring all those experiences to creating adventures for a new game. But it is nice when the game itself says, here's some advice for creating adventures for our system, giving what the system may be doing or what we're not trying to do, right? So I always appreciate when they give you some advice. So I'm not going to read through it, but the fact that it's there, adventure advice, campaign advice, session advice is really handy because I think especially with games like this, you might be reaching outside the gamer audience. Maybe, I don't know. Hard to say, right? I, I, it's really hard to say if this would 
because I feel like this is a game that would appeal to folks who love those kinds of, uh, you know, Tintin, Speed Racer, uh, all those kinds of action adventure sort of things, Lupin or Lupin, whatever, all, all these everything would find the system appealing and the art style and everything else would appeal to them. But I don't know, unfortunately, it's one of those things that probably you'd never find this at a place where you'd find those other things, which is kind of, I feel like this is where you'd want it. Like if I was running a bookstore, I'd want to have those kind of graphic novels, especially the sort of French style or Belgian style, European ones, the ones that are really big kind of books, at least classically they were. I noticed the other day they had, a, I was at a bookstore with my daughter and I stumbled across a collection of Asterix books and they were small. They weren't the big, I don't even know what size, but it seemed like, like legal sized almost. Uh, or maybe it's just letter sized books, but this is where I'd want to put at the end of it, put this, <clears throat> this, these core rules, but they'll probably never see it. In any case, if you happen to be running into people who are just brand new or brand new to running games, great to give them some advice on how to actually make adventures for the game. And then we have, this is the grand enemy, the octopus, which I'm just going to scroll through just so you can see it, but I'm not going to read all of it. And then we've got all this stuff for different basically npcs for the mob the army secret agents law and order and then octopus agents and then animals and beasts and then we have a calendar for 1965 and then name lists oh man they really did gave you a lot oh profanities oh oh that's, these are cool so some rude but not actually swear swear words for uh it looks like you have french And a whole bunch of them. I'd be like, zut, flute, no. <laughs> Sabre de bois, sabre de bois. It's a wooden sword, nice. Oh, that's good. And then we've got a clue sheet and then the index. And then you can cut and make your own passport if you do not have one of the wonderful passports that is... Like so, you can uh, make your own passport. All right, so this is the core books. I do have some other uh, troubleshooters content in terms of we have an, at least one adventure, I think. There's a couple other things. But I, I want to say, uh, well, thanks to, uh, thanks to, what is it? Who sent this to me? Was it Helmgast, I think, is the name of the publisher, who actually sent this over to me. Let me pull out the book again. Yes, I believe it was Helmgast. Yeah, so thanks to Helmgast for uh, sending it to me, the book. If you're interested in this, I, I, I linked to it in drive through I'm not sure. This, this is a joint publication of Helmgast, Modifius, and I think it's called Arcane something. <laughs> the one I linked to. So on drive through it actually is linked to the publisher Arcane something or other. <laughs> Hold on, I should probably get that correct. Let me, let's see, this was Arcane Asylum. Okay, so under, in, in drive through and there's a link, there's a direct link, but it, it's uh, linked to the publisher Arcane Asylum. But it's also, again, Homegast and Modifius, the hardcover book. It's beautiful, full color, big. I think this is kind of a similar size to what sort of your Tintin, Asterix, kind of classic uh, comic graphic novel size would be. A uh, big book, really nice, beautiful, but you can also find it on PDF. They have these wonderful physical passports, which I just showed a minute ago, for filling out your characters. This is awesome. I would love to find or make something like this that's for fantasy games if I could. So you kind of have, have that going on. You can get custom. They have their own dice. You can get, you can get all this stuff, but of course you can play with just a D100 and a bunch of D6s. And the you can use the PDFs, but it's a really nice, really nice product. I want to say, of course, having only read this, I feel like this does a good job. I think that this does a good job bringing out, focusing on your sort of, I'm going to keep calling it Tintin-esque, Tintin-esque adventures. I like the way it's set up because normally I'm not a fan. I've probably mentioned this too many times to count. I'm not usually a fan of the, the, the sort of, I don't know, movie uh, movie terminology in terms of games because I, I i think it just i don't know it's just not the tone that i'm going for but i think it makes perfect sense in this because you 
are basically living through a movie, a graphic novel, a, a that's kind of the, the, the session, the rhythm of the session, everything's sort of geared towards that. So I, I feel like in this way, it is kind of appropriate talking about scenes and being knocked out and kind of tossed out and kind of at the end of things. And I think that kind of, I think it, I think it works. I also think that because they're trying to give you this targeted experience, this is not a game that's trying to be every game for you. They're focused on, okay, we want this kind of Tintin, Lupin, whatever sort of feel, a little bit of James Bond, just without the kind of lethality, sort of a, maybe more of a, uh, the kind of TV, uh, TV sort of agent shows, whether it's classic Mission Impossible or uh, the Avengers, something like that kind of show. And it's in this version takes place in the sixties. So it's kind of, those also sort of fit right in. So we're really, we're focused in there. So everything is about giving you that experience and trying to lead you down into having a fun time playing and running through that experience. I think it does a good job with that. Obviously the illustrations help a lot just in terms of conveying theme, but also all the mechanics I think fit in there. I didn't think I saw anything that made it stand out as like, okay, this thing, why are we doing it like this? If our goal is to be like that kind of show, then why do we have this mechanic that seems to be running opposed to it? I think they've done a nice job getting everything moving in the same direction, including advice to the GM and for players is, hey, keep moving in that direction. If there's one time that bad things can kind of happen. It's going to be when you try to make the game something it's not meant to be. So let's all stay in this lane and we'll all have fun. And I think it does a great job. I totally miss the Kickstarter as usual. I miss, I miss all these things. So hopefully, I don't know how popular this game is. I have no idea if there's a, a large contingent, but hopefully you'll take a look at it if this kind of theme, this kind of game, playing in this sort of game appeals to you because it's a really nice, really well put together product. Alvalder says, Helmgast are the creators. I believe Arcane did the French version since it was, released by, was released bilingual. Oh, okay, so that starts to make sense. And maybe a uh, distributor in maybe for the US? Not sure, but okay, that is great. So, but thanks again folks for hanging out with me on the troubleshooters. I'll probably will take a tight, a little bit of a break. Maybe we'll look at the uh, module later this week, maybe next week. We shall see, but hope you enjoyed it. And, you know, give these things a try. Uh, I've always found for myself, <laughs> when I look at my analytics that when I, and I don't know if it's just because people don't associate me with games outside of say fantasy, but evil type stuff, but I feel like they don't get the love. Maybe that they, that they deserve and, and hopefully some folks will see this and be intrigued, not necessarily to buy it if they don't like it, but to kind of look outside maybe some of our wheelhouses. Because I do love me some fantasy gaming. And if I had to pick one, I probably would pick fantasy as my one. But I love all games. I love reading about games. And you always find stuff that, I, like I love the zones and setting up those encounter areas, is I think is kind of brilliant in its own way. That uh, you don't, you, you, you can't ever get those new ideas if you don't read and try new things. So try something new. Try the troubleshooters. I don't know. I might. I mean, I, if I can ever get a game going, my own game is on hiatus and it's hard for me to get games, but maybe I'll have to do a troubleshooters one shot. Maybe I can do it on the channel because I think it can be a lot of fun there. All right, folks, that's all I got. I'm, I'm blathering on now, so I'm just going to let you all go. If you give a thumbs up on your way out, that would be awesome. If you're not in here and you enjoyed it and you feel like subscribing, that would also be awesome. Otherwise, Game on, everybody. I will talk to you later. Bye now.